Hi everyone, uh, my name is James Cruz. I'm here to welcome you to the second part of our program, Radical Aliveness and Belonging Today. I'm uh, the poet, so I'm gonna be easing us into a space of um, that deeper listening that we talked about before. And uh, so in order to do that, I'm gonna start off with just a couple of poems and this first one is called Natural Silence. So I believe that there's a silence that's natural to all of us. And that once we get still enough, we actually get in touch with this silence inside that meets the silence outside of us. And I will tell you that this was also written after a meditation retreat where I was able to um, more deeply pay attention to the world inside and outside of me. So this is called Natural Silence. It's not easy to find the silence behind traffic noise and the rush of a jet dragging its contrails through the sky. But here it is again in the in-between when I learn to listen long enough to the call and response of birdsong, to wind pulsing in the canopies of trees, and every wing flutter of the Phoebe who's built her cup of a nest out of moss and mud beneath the eaves of our house. I know the stillness will last for just a few beats before the roar of a Harley takes over and a tractor rumbles through the rocky field outside my window. So I sink into it while I can, as I do into water so clean and clear, for a moment at least, I swear I can see to the bottom of everything. I hear some breaths going in, coming out. That's a good time for that in between poems. Um, so this next one is called Neighbors. And uh, this one is actually printed in your programs as well. And I just want to tell you a little bit about the background of this poem. So I live in a very small town in Vermont. And I've lived in cities for most of my life. So this was a huge adjustment for me. Um, as you can imagine, and it turns out that people expect you to acknowledge them when you're in a small town, because if you don't, then it will get back to your husband or your mother-in-law or your father-in-law or your boss, and it doesn't look good. Uh, so this is about my, my learning to pause and acknowledge other people, and I, I really do believe that um, we can't all live in a small town. We don't all want to live in a small town, but we can create these small communities wherever we go. Uh, this was spoken about earlier to some degree, and, um, and I truly believe that we can all be neighbors. We are all neighbors on this planet. Where I'm from, people still wave to each other, and if someone doesn't, you might say of her, she wouldn't wave at you to save her life. But you try anyway. Give her a smile. This is just one of the many ways we take care of one another. Say, I see you, I feel you, I know you are real. I wave to Rick who picks up litter while walking his black labs, olive and basil hauling donut boxes, cigarette packs, and countless beer cans out of the brush beside the road. And I say hello to Christy, who leaves almond croissants in our mailbox and mason jars of fresh-pressed apple cider on our side porch. I stop to check in on my mother-in-law, more like a second mother, 
who buys us toothpaste when it's on sale and calls if an unfamiliar car is parked at our house. <laughs> we are going to have to return to this way of life, this giving without expectation, this loving without conditions. We need to stand eye to eye again and keep asking no matter how busy, how are you, how's your wife, how's your knee, making this talk we insist on calling small, though kindness is what keeps us alive. Thank you all. Well, thank you so much, James. Uh, James introduced himself, so I feel relieved of the burden. Uh, welcome back to part two of the symposium, and we'd like to welcome back our panelists in just a moment, uh, who will rejoin us on the stage, with the exception, as was mentioned prior, of Rachel Bagby, who was gone to better things. Uh, so I have here in the second half the entirely onerous task of introducing Brother David Stendel Rost, someone who many of you will have read uh, extensively and many will have known for far longer than I have. But I have at least the distinction of being something that none of you are, and that is I am one of the archivists for David Stendel Rost. A few years ago, my colleagues at Special Collections and I here at UMass were presented with this strange-sounding task of preserving the papers of a Benedictine monk. And I have to admit that my first reaction was, it probably could have gone better, but I, 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 my first reaction was that, you know, don't they just live in the woods? Um, now I have to say, I, I, I probably should have known better then, but, but I, I didn't. Um, because Brother David is one of those great souls in life who really walks the world in radiant arcs and leaves a trail of love and understanding behind him everywhere he goes. If he does live in woods, I'm truly grateful that there are woods all across the globe. He's a remarkably young 93. He spent nearly seven decades, almost seven decades, living by the rule of St. Benedict and engaged in a very deep interfaith conversation that's taken him wherever there's a map. He's been a bridge builder and a willing collaborator in meaningful dialogues with Zen Buddhism, learning directly from teachers such as Hakun Yajitami, Shunaya Suzuki, Son Nakagawa. He's been a pillar in the peace movement, thanks in part to Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, he's wielded his spirituality in the cause of social justice virtually everywhere he's gone. He was and he is a deeply moving writer, a great speaker, an expositor of gratefulness in his spiritual practice of contemplative prayer, and the philosophy of mindfulness. He's most importantly, a great lover of cats. <laughs> so it's a special honor for us today to have Brother David back from Austria. This is a special trip, a special thing for us, I hope a special thing for him. And I hope we can all welcome him with gratitude and with a thanks befitting of the occasion. Thank you, Brother David. Thank you. Go first. Oh, he's not today. It's the sound of the chairs. I was <laughs> like, like, what, what is happening? <laughs> it sounded like a flock of birds yeah, exactly. suddenly got in here. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming here. Thank you all who have worked to prepare this event. 
for making <coughs> it possible for us to have this conversation. And I mean really everybody, uh, not only the organizers, but also the cleaning personnel and yeah. all the many, many people who have worked to bring us here. Uh, we will never know their names, and yet they are the ones that we are to be grateful for, deeply grateful. Mm. Before we... Uh, before the first session here, we had a rather remarkable conversation in the green room with our group and several of the speakers in the first part have already referred to it. And <coughs> it was so re remarkable for me personally because I was caught speechless. <laughs> 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 with, which is unusual for somebody who has to do so much talking all over the world. Uh, and I was caught speechless because I asked the other speakers, uh, what in this world in which there are so many discouraging elements, what is it that encourages you? What gives you encouragement? And uh, each one of them said something quite convincing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then they asked me, and what encourages you? And to my own surprise, I could really not give a, an, an, an honest answer. Everybody said, and everybody keeps saying, for all the life-denying things, uh, there are life-affirming th things going on in the world. And I don't want to call it good and bad. I call it life-affirming and life-denying. That is clearer, and I prefer that language. So for all the life-denying things, there are real efforts that we can pinpoint uh, as life-affirming, and they do give us encouragement. But you can unfortunately turn this around, and you can say for every life-affirming thing, there is something like denying thing going on in our world. And <clears throat> I want something that uh, gives me encouragement beyond hope. Hope is no problem for me. Uh, hope for me is defined as openness for surprise. Mm -hmm. That is very different from hopes. Uh, you have the hopes and then uh, you have to have a very clear idea what you hope for when you have hopes and before you know it, uh, either your hopes are fulfilled, which is wonderful, or the hopes go down the drain. And whether you are really a person of hope will show itself if you come up with a whole new crop, uh, crop of hopes. Because <laughs> you are open for surprise. Oh, these hopes didn't work out. Some others will, we hope. <laughs> <laughs> so hope is not a problem for me, but I need to see in our world something which makes me spontaneously say that's a basis that will, on that basis we will get through. And that basis I do not yet see. And I had to think about that basis and I hope that in the end, I will be able to somehow show you what I mean, what I would expect as that basis that seems to be lacking at the present moment. Mm. But this brings us immediately, this is, the core, <coughs> this is a core question of spirituality and social challenge. <coughs> 
I will very briefly say why uh, social challenge, challenge and social change and spirituality are absolutely necessarily connected because I define spirituality as aliveness. Spirituality, the term comes from the Latin word spiritus, life, breath, life, and spiritual people are alive. And spirituality allows of many degrees, and you are that much more spiritual, the more alive you are. And it has to include all areas of your life and all levels of your being. It has to begin with your bodily aliveness. You ought to be alive in, in your body. You ought to be alive emotionally, intellectually. We ought to be alive also <coughs> to the great mystery of life, the great mystery with which we are confronted in life. And when I say mystery, I don't mean something mis um, uh, vague, but mystery is a real, I was going to say a reality, but I better say an actuality, because it isn't a thing, it is a, a force. Uh, mystery is an actuality, a force, which we can, that works on us, which we can never intellectually grasp, mm. but which we can understand if it grasps us. We have to allow it to do something to us. And if that sounds, <coughs> if that sounds abstract, simply think of music. Uh, nobody can intellectually and conceptually grasp the essence of music. We can say many things about music, but the essence of music we cannot grasp. But we all say we can understand music when it does something to us. It speaks to me, it does something for me, it, uh, it carries me away, it sweeps, sweeps me off my feet, whatever. It's, uh, you are always the passive one, and the music is doing something. <coughs> and in that sense, we are confronted in life also with that mystery. We are, the, as human beings, uh, inevi inevitably interacting with this mystery, which we cannot get into grips, cannot grasp, but we can understand if we really enter into it and allow it to do something to us. And that is, in a sense, the, the highest level of spirituality, the highest level of being alive, is to be alive to that great mystery of life, because it is in life that we encounter that mystery. Mystery itself is totally, uh, life itself is totally mysterious to us, and it is in this life that we, in, through living, that we encounter that mystery. And uh, obviously, to all the different levels of life belongs our social life and our responsibility, our social re responsibilities. And therefore, it, it cannot be any question at all that uh, spirituality ha uh, is extremely relevant uh, to social action, social change, social engagement. And it is rather surprising that this has sometimes been doubted and sometimes uh, even negated, and sometimes, uh, um, and very many times, it's, it's not, we are not aware of it. So every person that um, tries to be a spiritual person ought to be alive to the fact how important and how central uh, social engagement is for us. And here comes 
Uh, my big question uh, do we really know who we are before we can interact with one another, we have to know who we are. And we need to ask, start with ourselves. And so I, not in general who we are, but first each one of us needs to start with who am I. Mm -hmm. And I invite you, uh, not um, just to try and, I'm not trying to tell you something, um, I invite you to go with me and ask your way, follow your, through questions, your way to who am I? And of course you'll say, I'm somebody. That is undeniable, everybody is somebody. But there we are already at a very mysterious reality. I am somebody. That means I am this body. And if you step on my toes, I will say, ouch, that's me. <laughs> so it, I am that body. But I turn around and I say, I have a body. Are you a, does this body have a body? Somebody has a body? It's a very strange situation. <laughs> <laughs> Who is it that has my body? <laughs> and I will say, myself. Ah, we have introduced something else. I, this body, and myself. Who is that self? That strange self that has a body. Uh, I invite you, we all know what it means myself, you know yourself, but I invite you to find that self. Mm -hmm. And that is very easy, you just watch your body. So you watch your body. I can watch myself, I can close my eyes and interiorly watch my body sitting here, and you can do the same. Uh, and if there is still somebody who is watching the watcher that's watching your body, well, you are not back far enough. <laughs> <laughs> Go just one step further until you reach the watcher whom nobody is watching. <laughs> That's yourself. And that self, in contrast to your body, is not in time and space. Ooh. That is a very interesting fact. <laughs> Man. Keep writing. Man. I'm, ki I'm <laughs> writing. Okay, take notes. Man. Can you say that again? <laughs> You're not in time and space yourself. Yeah. Uh, it is not in time and space uh, because it can watch time and space. It is you, you yourself experience it, that you are outside of time and space, but not completely. It is also you are also in time and space. When you, you are, uh, the poet Rilke calls this uh, a double realm. Oh, we all live in this double realm, and that is one realm of being that is in time and space and out of time and space. Uh, in the present moment, whenever we are in the present moment, we are in what T.S. Eliot calls a moment in and out of time. We are, as in the body, we are in time, but we are at the same time out of time, when we are really in the now. And so you recognize yourself also, you can find it again, when you remember that when you think about the past, it is always now, 
and you can't, you, you know it's the past, but it's, the past is now when you remember it. You can <laughs> only remember it as now. And you are yourself, that one self that you are in the present. And when you imagine the future, or, uh, you are also imagining yourself in some imagined future setting, but it is now. The future, when it comes, will be now, and when you imagine it, it is now. So, again, T.S. Eliot says in the Four Quartets, this wonderful word, all is always now. All is always now. <laughs> and at first you think uh, that is um, obvious, but if you think, more, the more you think about it, the more mysterious it becomes. So yourself is in this present moment, is now, um, is one with your body, but your body had a beginning in time. If it's in time and space, it had a beginning. Uh, it will have an end. We all know that. As human beings, we know that we'll die. We know that there was a time when we were not around. Uh, your self is not in time. Therefore, it has no beginning and no end. Yeah. And, and this, now we come to the decisive point, because it is not in time and space, it cannot be divided. <laughs> Nothing that is not in time and space, can, how are you going to divide it? And that f leads to the insight, and that is the decisive thing for me, the insight that there is only one self for all of us. Uh, our I, our body, uh, is so different from one another. Not even twins have the same uh, fingerprint. We are enormously different. And I encourage you sometimes to think how different you are. It is amazing how different. Amazing. We, see, we are so much more different from one another than we ever think when we begin to, to explore that. But our self is one for all of us. We have one self. There is, uh, in the monastery, uh, uh, once a month, we have a service for children, and uh, after that, we have a puppet show. Uh, in Austria, these puppet shows are very popular. Uh, kids always want to see these hand puppets. And uh, uh, since there are uh, too many persons on this, uh, in, the, in the play, very often, one monk has to play two different uh, characters with, with one hand a different one. So he may be playing the, the alligator with one hand and the princess with the other. <laughs> and this is such a fitting picture <laughs> for the self that is playing with all these... The one self is playing with these innumerable... Uh, eyes. <laughs> See? Mm. Uh, again, it's something that is only an image, but mm -hmm. if you follow it up, there is more to it. It has a poetic reality that is more than just being an image out there. And imagine what a difference it would make to us if we were aware that we are one. <laughs> to look at the other person and say, wow, you are really different. You are enormously different. But we are one. <laughs> uh, imagine what a difference it would make when you, for you when you, Im when you meet the alligator uh, and you can realize, remember quickly, yeah, I'm the princess and this is the alligator coming, but it is one self that's playing both roles. Mm -hmm. And that is, 
the reason why, for instance, in the Christian, all the traditions have recognized this. Uh, all, uh, all the great traditions recognize that great self that we all have in common. And in Buddhism, it's simply called Buddha nature. Uh, in Hinduism, it's called Atman, beautiful word that has to do with our breathing, and we are breathing one breath all together. Uh, in the Christian tradition, it's called the Christ self, or the Christ reality. And St. Paul says, I live, yet not I, Christ lives in me. I live, but my self is the Christ self. And he says that not privately for himself, that is true for each one of us. So our self, our shared self, is the Buddha nature, is the Atman, is the Christ self. And therefore, uh, the Hebrew uh, 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 command, love your neighbor as yourself. And very often this is mistranslated in English, love your neighbor as like yourself. Here you are, there's your neighbor, he's not anything like you, and you are supposed to like him. Uh, it becomes a kind of mental acrobatic. First you have to love yourself, like as if you were somebody else, and then you love somebody else, <laughs> who is really somebody else. It gets very complicated. <laughs> the Hebrew, in Hebrew, you could also say, love your neighbor like yourself, but that's not what it says. It says, love your neighbor as yourself, because you love, you have to love yourself, because by love, I don't mean any um, feeling, uh, it's wonderful if feeling a is added to love. That's a wonderful thing. But love is an attitude. And it is uh, the, the attitude of saying yes to belonging. I really struggled for a very long time to find a working definition for love that will work in every situation. Think of the innumerable ways in which we say I love. Love for uh, your country, love for your spouse, love you for your dog. Uh, every, everything, innumerable ways of loving, but they all have in common. I say, yes, we belong together. I belong to that dog and that dog belongs to me. And it's a mutual, it's always mutual belonging not like your belongings that you have. Like. It's a mutual belonging. And therefore, love your neighbor as yourself means say to your neighbor, a neighbor means the next best, anybody, say to that neighbor, yes, we belong together. We are one self, we are one self. And that is what would give me a, a sign of encouragement yeah. if in this world in which in so many countries everything is 50-50. That's the terrible thing, you see. It's the, the, our society is breaking apart in two halves everywhere. And if uh, we would remember, yes, they are the others. Love of enemy is necessary. Uh, and your enemy must remain your enemy because if your enemy becomes your friend because you love him, uh, you are loving your friend. Uh, if you love your enemy, the other one must remain your enemy. If somebody is set on destroying the environment, that's my enemy because he's also my enemy and he will be an enemy to me. But if I love that enemy, I will remember we belong together, we are one self, and I will not do anything that is unfair or uh, destroying to him 
but I will do everything to thwart him from destroying the environment. That, that's what, what the enmity means. And my great hope, uh, remember what I said about hopes, they can go <laughs> down the train. <laughs> my great hope, and at the same time, the token of encouragement that I would look for in, in our world is if more and more people would recognize that we are one with all our divisions, not making them light, not uh, uh, glossing over them, um, we develop through uh, difficulties and through strife. Uh, but with all that, remember, we are one. And I invite you as a sort of a closing kind of little ritual for this input of mine. If you look at a person next to you, uh, you don't even say, need to say anything, but look at that person and allow yourself to feel no matter how different we are, we are one. We, have, we are one self. Allow yourself to do that. Yeah, what a gift. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Thank you. Yeah. It's, it's, um, hard to look and clap at the same time. So I think there was, <laughs> people were still, it's a great exercise. You can look both directions, look everywhere. Thank you, Brother David. You're welcome. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I, it's extraordinary to hear you share your thinking with us and your honesty. It's incredibly moving for, for all of us and I think gives us great pause to consider. It's very important not to shortchange the process to hope, to possibility, to um, ease, and you challenge us in ways that are very important um, to be self-examining. And I want to say we have these friends here on stage who have come to be with you, who represent the one self that's all out there in many bodies um, in the audience. And we, uh, we don't have time for um, everyone in the audience to ask questions. And I'm going to repeat the questions for Brother David. Um, he can be challenged with his hearing. Um, but we have our friends on stage are interested in being able to ask him a question, ask you a question, Brother David. So um, I have sad news, which is Greg also, he's not going with Rachel, but he's following close behind. He has another engagement, he has to be in Atlanta. So we're gonna make sure that he gets to go first and ask a question. Thank you. Brother David, what a gift. Uh, thank you for guiding us. So, um, you know, you often wonder, how do you ask a question of such a guru? Um, and I have one question, um, but my mind traveled to a few. I really wanted to intellectually ask you about life energy and how life energy connects to social action. Life energy. Life energy. No. That's, so. not, that's not the question. Okay. No. <laughs> he wanted to ask I you about to life energy, you. but he's not going to. I also wanted to ask you about what it means to have an inner joy that is inspired by a constant awareness of death and how that affects vocation. But I can't ask okay. that one either. You heard, you heard he's not going to ask. Next time. Next, next time. time. <laughs> next time. So um, when I get home, every, every night before um, my children go to sleep, we pray together. And my son Gregory is very monastic already. And so he's going to ask me, what did you learn today, Daddy? <laughs> and um, 
I'd like to ask you a question on his behalf. How what? old? How old is your son? He's twelve. So, on behalf of his twelve-year-old son, he's going to ask you a question. Um, what are the three most important life lessons that you have gained on your ninety-three-year-old journey? <laughs> <laughs> I'm writing them down. <laughs> Thank you. For Greg. Thank For Greg. Thank you very much, Greg. Nobody has asked me that before, so I will have to think a little bit. The three most important insights. Life lessons. Life lessons. Mm -hmm. Well, the first one that comes to mind is, and I learned that very late in life, uh, that the only thing that really matters uh, when the trips are down is kindness, to be kind, no matter what. The second one that comes to mind is there's always a way out. <laughs> uh, for me, that is a very important uh, insight into the difference between distinction between anxiety and fear. Mm -hmm. Anxiety is uh, inevitable in life. We go from one anxiety to the other, uh, and anxiety uh, makes us feel narrow and, and squeezed together. Everything squeezed together when we feel that. And now we can have two responses to that feeling of being squeezed in or being in a tight spot, as we say. The one possibility is fear. And fear puts out bristles and gets stuck in that place. And the other option is trust. Hmm. And if we trust, everything comes out well because we go through this, and you know it when you look back on your own life, you don't need to be very old to do that, you see that there were situations that were so tight spots, such tight spots that you thought this was the end of all. And somehow you got through into a new birth. And we even come into this life through a very narrow birth canal. And uh, at that time, we don't have to uh, think yet. We do it instinctively. But what we do instinctively when we are born, we need to do over and over again, trust and go through. And then it will go from one birth to the other, and it, it, it gets wider and wider, our life. So that was number two, and you wanted three. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be grateful. <laughs> and so will we. Take your time. Well... I would say life is good to us. Mm. And that is something that you have to trust in. Uh, if you don't trust that life is good to you, the worst has already happened. Mm. So simply from that consideration, <laughs> it is a good idea <laughs> to trust in life. <laughs> but. When you trust in life, you find that uh, life proves itself trustworthy. Mm. And in our Western tradition, 
that is so beautifully expressed by the word Amen. Uh, the Hebrew word Amen is uh, the human answer to the amunah of God, to the trustworthiness of God. So by saying Amen, we express the trust, the trust in the trustworthiness of that great mystery which we encounter in life and through life. Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful that <coughs> Jews, Christians, and Muslims all have retained that one word together. Uh, and that's why I like to call these Western traditions the Amen traditions. Yeah. Uh, that it expresses their core trust and expresses that they are really closely connected with one another. Yeah, thank you for this gift. You're welcome. And give my love to the young guy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. What is yes. his name? Greg Gregory. After his dad. Thank you. I need a hug. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for your visit. Thank you. Peace out. Stay fearless. Was that for a question? Yeah. <laughs> three, yeah. <laughs> that was three questions. Yeah, it well, was. <laughs> but you know how 12 year old kids are, right? You got to bring them back a lot. Mirabai, would you like to? Sure. Can you hear? Yeah. First, I want to say that um, I really appreciate. Brother David, you saying that you felt hopeless or look now, I noticed that in teaching or with others, I tend not, even when I'm feeling that, I tend not to say it. I tend to look for the whatever rays of hope there are, you know. And when other people say it to me, I'm like busy saying, oh yes, but, you know. But when you said that, and I told you this, what spontaneously arose in me, it's kind of funny, was how can I be, how can I quickly be a better person so that Brother David will, <laughs> will, will find some hope? That's what came up in me. Yeah. Can you repeat that? She, when, when you were struggling to feel hopeful, she immediately thought her first thought was, I wish I could be a better person right away so that Brother Dagger could help give Brother David some hope. <laughs> so that you're expressing what you did, you know, will have variations of that in different people. That's a good thing. But hope you don't have to give me hope. It's openness for surprise. I have that. Uh -huh. oh, right. But some uh, sufficient encouragement. Sufficient uh, <laughs> encouragement. Yes. 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 <laughs> Well, now I'm going to ask a question. Uh, as you know, I spent a couple of years recently writing a book with your old friend Ramdas on uh, dying. We called it uh, Walking Each Other Home, Conversations on Loving and Dying. So I, I know you've written a lot about it because I've read it, but uh, what would you say to, what I noticed in writing it and then when it was published, people don't like to talk about dying, you know. They, they, want, they don't want to think or talk about dying. Uh, what would you say to us about the importance of paying attention to the fact that we all are going to die? What would you say to all of us about the importance of talking about the fact and being open to the fact that we are all going to die? Yes. And how is that related to love? How is that related to love, Brother David? Uh, this is a <coughs> very uh, 
a poignant pr question for me personally because I grew up uh, in the shadow of death. Uh, when I was uh, entering my teens, I was 12, uh, Hitler came to Austria, and all my teens I lived under Nazi occupation of Austria. And uh, even eventually was drafted to the army and uh, miraculously uh, came out alive. Uh, more of my uh, childhood and, and uh, friends of my youth died in the war than uh, lived. Uh, we, we really had death at all times before our eyes. And uh, I, uh, at that time also, we read every book that we knew the Nazis wouldn't want us to read. <laughs> So, uh, we even read The Rule of St. Benedict, it's a little book. <laughs> uh, I, I, no idea why I, why I ever got it, but we read everything that we knew we shouldn't read, like teenagers do. Uh, and in this book, there is a, among, in one chapter, is a list of topics on which the abbot is supposed to give talks to the monks. That's what it seems to be. Uh, nowadays it's called the list of good works, but probably it was originally a list of topics that the abbot gave talks about. And one of those uh, topics is to have death at all times before your eyes. And when I read that, uh, it struck a note, but uh, that was about all. I didn't keep thinking about it. it. I just remember it really, really, that sentence touched me deeply. And we, my generation, uh, did not expect to survive. Not that we thought we wouldn't survive, or that we thought we would survive, we just didn't think about it, I probably suppressed it. But the idea that we would be 20 one day and the war would be over, that was totally out of our reach. As if you would imagine now that one day you will be uh, 200 years old and sitting on the moon or something like that. <laughs> you never think about it, but it's, it's just it's not there. And then the war was over and I was alive and I was 19 years old and I had life ahead of me. And it was such an unbelievable experience. And at that very moment, I remembered that passage to have death at all times before my eyes because it occurred to me that the reason why we were so happy, because you know, we were ecstatically happy during my youth. I wouldn't want to trade it with any other, even though the external circumstances were terrible, but uh, no, uh, we were really, really happy. And it was before, because we had death before our eyes, and that meant we had to live in the present moment. That is the decisive thing, you see. So, uh, to live in the present moment, where else can you live? <laughs> <laughs> and most of us live in the present moment, but about 45% are in the past, hanging on to the past, or, uh, bewailing the good old days that are no longer there, whatever, and another 40% are ahead of us and wishing, I can't wait, and wishing, wishing for the, uh, a little left to be in the present moment, to be alive in the present moment. And that would be the reason why thinking about death would make you so much more alive. You, see, you can really only be alive if you keep in mind, who knows if there's another moment. You see? That would be my answer. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. No, I, I've, you know, thought about that a lot and heard words, you know, and kind of know that at one level. But 
just hearing you tell that, I, it was as if I was hearing it for the very first time. Thank you. It, it um, makes us think, live as if there is no tomorrow, yeah, yeah. and love as if there is no tomorrow. Beautiful, beautiful way of expressing that. Um, I want to give both Lucas and James a chance to ask you a quick question, and then we're going to close up. Then we'll be done. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> so fast. Uh, but it's a beautiful day outside, and we can... Yes. yes. <laughs> um, let me go next to Lucas. Do you have something you would like to ask Brother David Lucas? I do. I do. I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to ask... So I, I remember... Uh, from your conversation with uh, Krista Tippett, you described the way that um, when you were a baby, your mother said that y you, you, uh, you only cried, or you only stopped crying if you, if, when you were not swaddled, <laughs> right? Held tight. Yeah, held tight. And you referenced that in the conversation um, as a description of the world you lived in uh, that nurtured you, as a description of, you know, the, 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 Hell. the, right, the cultural context that gave you the undergirding of support. I'm, I'm curious as to what, what do you feel like, how, how, how can we give the, the support, the, the right sort of foundation mm. and the right formation for people in this present moment. Like what, what, you know, uh, the, the Christendom that was, that was a part of your life in Austria yeah. at that time, yeah. that structured life and that gave you that sense of order that you found nurturing, you know, it's, it's, it's given way to a, a new, more complicated set of surroundings and circumstances that we live in. And yet, we still have to find ways to give that foundation and support. Yeah, yeah. So I'm wondering what your reflections are on that. That brings me back, actually, to uh, a very important concept that I didn't mention as such, and that is human dignity. Uh, how can we give one another a sense of human dignity out of a sense of human dignity? Uh, and what I described as knowing that we are all one would express itself concretely. Uh, you, you, you have it in the back of your mind, we are all one self and so on, but concretely it would express itself in human dignity. And human dignity uh, demands two things. Uh, there are now many books about it, and it's a, a, a much discussed topic, but basically what all uh, those who speak about it and write about it agree on is that in order for a child to grow up with human dignity, it needs two things. The child must be given unconditional love. It must know, in other words, you belong to us, you belong to this family. Uh, if you misbehave, you will be uh, punished, etc. That's fine, but that has nothing to do with not belonging. You belong unconditionally. The child must feel that. And the second thing is, the child must be um, treasured for its uniqueness. In other words, you, you're not so, uh, we, we don't love you so much because uh, you co conform. You don't belong because you conform. You, we, we treasure you so being so different, you see. So these two things, the child must make, uh, grow up with a sense of, I really belong, there's no question about that. And my uniqueness is uh, respected and treasured. 
And we also know that so many people in our society just don't have that kind of a childhood, you see? And so we have many adults who do not have this sense of human dignity, and therefore it's very difficult also to treat others with dignity. And that is really, as I understand it, the basis of your question, how should we treat one another? And there is a very, very difficult task because we have to give the other person uh, a sense of belonging, look at them with that sense, we belong together, we are one, <laughs> without saying anything, just the way you treat them, and uh, I respect you in your uniqueness. And uh, if a person has never received that in their childhood, it will, be, it will take a lot more than that one or another person says that to them. But we can, there is a possibility, we can wake people up, and especially for ourselves, if we think, I've never really been, been given this sense of, you, uh, of dignity. How can I acquire it? Uh, you are not depending on other people as of respecting you and in your uniqueness and feeling uh, one with you. Life itself holds you, you see? That is this, life holds you. You can never fall out of it. You belong to life. You be, in life, everything is interfaced with everything else and interlaced. We belong to life whether we want, want it or not. <coughs> and at the same time, life affirms you in your uniqueness. Where do you get it from? From life, from that great mysterious uh, force that drives. Thank you. Thank you. It's beautiful. That force that through the green fuse drives the flower drives my life. Mm. The flower in all its uniqueness and its connectedness with everything. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. James, would you like to, do you have something you'd like to ask? I have so many things I would love to ask Brother David. Um, but I, I think just related to that idea of dignity, um, going back to your previous question about you know, what encourages us. Um, I think about where the word courage comes from, comes from the heart, oh. right? So what, what fills our heart? And at a time when a lot of us can maybe feel brokenhearted, I feel like my heart is filled again when I see people coming together and connecting or helping each other out when they don't have to. And even in small ways, you know, when someone holds the door, or meets your eyes, or says thank you. And so, um, you know, that, that to me is kindness, and you mentioned kindness earlier. So I'm curious how you would define kindness and maybe how that, how that fits into spiritual practice. Interesting, I always try to uh, define, be very clear about terms that I use and think about the definition, and very often the language itself uh, gives you a, a lead, but I did never, never thought of very explicitly about kindness, but obviously it comes from kind. We are the same kind, you see? And this is how you behave towards somebody with whom you belong together. Kindness is the way you behave to those to whom you belong. And obviously, if you keep in mind, we are one self you will be kind to everybody. You will treat them as uh, your family. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 
Well, thank you for being our family, for being this big self on this afternoon. Um, I feel so deeply, deeply honored, Brother David, that you came to be with us from Austria for this trip. It's extraordinary. You, you weren't going to come back to the United States again. So we're really glad that you did and to see your archives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. And Lucas traveling from Amsterdam back to Amsterdam this weekend and Mirabai from Williamsburg <laughs> <laughs> and James from Vermont and of course Rachel from Virginia and Greg from Atlanta. I feel that this was a huge honoring and for all of you there are many people in this audience who have come very far for a moment in time for us to gather as, um, as kin. And um, I want to share something briefly with you, Brother David, before we part. Um, it's kind of a little surprise. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> we love surprise. Hope, hope, Brother David, remember. <laughs> surprise. Hope is about surprise. <laughs> So on behalf of the Board of Directors of A Network for Grateful Living, um, and in tandem um, with the University Archives here, the Special Collections, University Archives, and we're the co-sponsors of the event, um, but on behalf of the Board of Directors of A Network for Grateful Living who are here with us today, um, we have founded um, something in your honor here. And so um, we'd like to announce to everyone that we have established the Brother David Steindl Rast Spirituality and Social Change Fellowship at UMass. So in perpetuity, Forevermore, you get to live on in all these ways. <laughs> to honor your legacy, Brother David, the fellowship ensures uh, engagement with your thinking and teachings by future generations of scholars through supporting an annual visiting fellow to come here to work in your archives, to conduct research, to engage with all of your archival materials. Mm-hmm across spirituality and social change in all of its many facets and in your spirit and to present work to their community and to our community to last forever. Thank you very much. Many, many times. And I want to say that um, in addition, just so that it's transparent, this is made possible by the bequest of Edda Hackel, who was a dear friend. So thank you so much. Maybe we can have one moment of remembering Edda Hacke. Absolutely. She was a very loving woman, very kind. Thank you. Thank you. Go forth and sow the seeds of love and change. (laughs) Thank you for joining us.